the last lesson I want to get to is actually a lesson that's taught by the state itself that the government has taught in the course of the crisis and this has to do with the state's bailout the state's bailout of the banks if we recall the situation over the last few or let's say last summer and that must have been actually a little bit before that now <laughs> the financial system was racing towards the edge major banks were going broke or were already broke the entire global market economy stood at the brink and then governments in the major capitalist countries mobilized dizzying sums of money in America this was the clear 700 billion uh, 700 billion dollars mobilized like that sums that were just absolutely astonishing all of it to save big investment banks investment banks from failure and to fend off the horrendous consequences of a failure of the banking system and what do we learn from that well clearly the state does not regard the financial industry as a business like any other that's not a big secret if a company fails that's something that the creditors and the debtors of that company well, like the company itself has to deal with its creditors if private individuals go bankrupt that's something that they have to work out with their creditors there's plenty of laws for that but that's certainly not a natural catastrophe the failure of the one is the success of its competitors and the market economy marches on but if a bank fails then the government is much more concerned the failure of even an individual bank of a decent size is an emergency that has to be dealt with and the failure of the banking system is a national catastrophe and it's actually quite interesting we've heard many many creative metaphors from politicians in the press on this if banks fail a slew of banks then a meltdown a meltdown threatens the economy was standing at the abyss since I haven't been in America I'm not sure what the other I'm sure there's lots of other creative metaphors one of my favorites was Henry Paulson saying when he was in front of the I think Senate committee said gentlemen if you don't save the banks today tomorrow you won't have an economy to save anymore in the eyes of the state a bank failure is in short an apocalyptic scenario and for that very reason the bailout itself enjoys both a very good and a very bad reputation the good reputation is well many are impressed first of all by the ability of the state to intervene actually save the banks and thereby to save our economy and many especially on the left are pleased to see the government reestablish its authority over the market they see the doctrine of neoliberal, uh, neoliberalism refuted and are happy to see a return to an economy where the state plays a big role in regulation at the same time many others have complained of what they regard to be a glaring injustice billions for the banks further sacrifices for the rest for taxpayers homeowners etc they argue that if the state apparently doesn't have any trouble mobilizing such enormous sums for the banks then it certainly must have enough to be able to provide for schools do more for poverty a whole list of social tasks that the state might be able to perform with such enormous sums of money but the state's response shows how inappropriate both these reputations are I'm not sure if any had a chance to see it but a few weeks ago Ben Bernanke gave an interview on uh, a three-day interview actually on the news hour with Nick Lair um, what's his name Jim Lair and it was a town hall meeting and one of the people in the audience asked him how could you do that <laughs> with a great deal of moral outrage how could you save the very people who caused the crisis and impose further sacrifices on the rest of the economy and he said I'm as upset as you are but given the fact that if the banks fail everything else fails we simply have to hold our nose and save the banks and there might be many who see that as a certain kind of cynicism or hypocrisy but 
I think we would do well to take that lesson seriously. If the head of the, hentri- set of head of the central bank says, if I don't save the banks, then the economy is gone, well, that tells us the business of the banks is this economy. That tells us that the wealth of this society doesn't consist in goods, in houses, in means of production. It consists in the power to finance. It consists in the power to finance sources of uh, sorry, finance wealth production, to finance capital accumulation. That's what Ben Bernanke is teaching us. That's a lesson we should listen to. In this economy, the wealth is power to get holds of goods, not the goods themselves. Power to get hold of goods for the purpose of turning money into more money. If that doesn't work, nothing else works. This intervention on the part of the government is also instructive in another sense. It reveals the nature of that wealth. As I talked about, it's power. That means that wealth in this economy, you think it's something that's just economic, something to do with economic calculations, nothing political. But what the bank's intervention proves is that the wealth of this economy is thoroughly political. It's thoroughly backed by state force. If the political power of the state is what rescued the banks, and with that the entire economy and its wealth, assets of big companies, assets of investment banks, but also savings of the normal people, (laughs) then this economy is not only founded upon the force of the state, but then money is a product of state force. It is the power to get access to sources of wealth. If the power to finance is the wealth of the nation, then the wealth of nation of the nation is a relationship of power. It's the power of exclusive ownership over wealth and the power to get hold of that wealth. And finally, I pointed out that the wealth of this nation is very political. But the manner of the state's intervention also teaches us something else. How much the state insists that the political purpose of that wealth is private property and to accumulate as private property. That fact is illustrated, first of all, by the constraints that the government imposes upon itself in saving the banks. Even while directly intervening in the economy, it didn't, let's say, suspend the profit calculations of the banks, it provided them with liquidity. What the state looked to do with its rescue program was to improve the means of, I'm sorry, improve the conditions for the bank's business, even to provide them with the means, but never to take away the calculations of the bank. Even in cases where the state nationalized the banks, as in England, it made perfectly clear we're not going to get involved with its lending operations, and even if we do, then it's to compel the banks to do their own business. To, bank, to make liquidity, to make the money that's given to them productive for their own enrichment. That's how much the state, with all its political force, insists that wealth in this economy is private accumulation. Wealth in this economy is private property. That insistence is also made clear by, well, by the powerlessness, the ultimate powerlessness of the state to restore the economy can improve the conditions for banks. It can even create stimulus packages of different kinds. But whether that actually stimulates the economy, whether growth actually happens, that's up to the economy. And even if the economy going gets going again, there's fears of inflation. Whether the state's intervention might have boosted the economy, but only at the cost of ruining the money of the state, ruining the money of the economy. What that moment of powerlessness, or that aspect of powerlessness teaches us, is just how much the state insists on two things. One, the wealth of my economy is political force. Second, the purpose of that political force is accumulation of private property in private hands for the purpose of private enrichment. Those are principles I'm not touching.
the state is even willing to put the money of its own economy at risk in order to save that purpose, private accumulation. Those are three very difficult lessons that I went through. <laughs> but the one thing I'd like to say in closing is the ultimate lesson is these things, the accumulation of private property, the accumulation of the power to get hold of sources of wealth in order to exploit labor and increase that money, that is what gets going again when the economy gets going again. That is what economic recovery means. And our hope is that if you understand that that's what economic recovery means, you'll lose the desire to hope for that economic recovery. That's all I have to say.